scripture reading this morning is found in Romans 11, 1 through 5. I'm reading in the, from the New International Version. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people, whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left and they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is remnant chosen by grace. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's wonderful to be a part of your worship fellowship this morning. In a special way, I'd like to say thank you to Pastor Michael for the invitation uh, and for the wonderful work he's doing for Jesus and for the church here in Pawpaw. Uh, when he was a student with us at the seminary, he was a great student, and we knew that he would be a great pastor as well. Our text this morning, which was just read in the scripture reading, is from Romans chapter 11, and the key verse is verse 2. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. And our topic today, how to know what God foreknows about our salvation. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for who you are, omniscient, all-knowing. You know even the choices we will make before we make them. And we want to praise you for being such a wonderful God. This gives us confidence in our journey through life, whether we are sick or healthy, whether we are weak or strong, even in a battle against cancer. We know that you know the way that we take, and when you try us, we shall come forth as gold. So bless us in this holy place and on this holy day, and work your miracle in our lives so that we can be your holy people. For we ask it in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Let the church say, amen, amen. Just a few days ago, on Thursday, October 1st, Chris Harper Mercer gunned down nine people in an Oregon community college. The people he killed ranged from age 18 through 67. Lucero Alcatraz, 19 years old. Traven Taylor Anspach. 20. Rebecca Ann Carnes, 18. Quinn Glenn Cooper, 18. Kim Saltmarsh Dietz, 59. Lucas Ibell, 18. Jason Dale Johnson, 33. Lawrence Levine, 67, and Serena Dawn Moore, 44. Was the killer so mentally ill that his actions were controlled apart from his free choice? Or is he free and responsible for what he did? If he had survived, we would try to settle that question in a court of law. But because he has died, we will have to leave that question to the judgment of God. And as Abraham said, the judge of all the earth will do right. 
But what about those who were reported to have testified to their faith in Jesus just seconds before they were killed? It seems that they made a free choice, doesn't it? Because they could have chosen to be quiet and increase their chances of survival. How to know what God foreknows about our salvation. I'm preaching today about the challenge of understanding the relationship of foreknowledge and freedom in relationship to salvation. This challenge can be articulated in terms of four questions. Does God really foreknow who will make a free choice to receive salvation or to refuse it? And if God foreknows what we're going to choose, then how can God be free to make his choices? Is he stuck with the things that he has foreseen about the future? Does God see the future as if it's already settled in concrete? And if so, how can he be free to do anything about the future that he foresees? Question number three, is it really true that we are free to receive and refuse salvation if God has foreknowledge of our choices? And finally, and the most important question for today, can we know what God foreknows about our free choices in relationship to salvation. Now you can see already that uh, this topic for our sermon today is a very challenging topic. But to help you wrestle with the issues of this subject, I'd like to draw your attention to a story about David and Saul that's recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 23. The part of the story we want to focus on is in verses 7 through 13. And I'll just paraphrase the story for you. You can follow in your Bibles. According to this story, the king Saul, who was the enemy of David, heard through his secret agents, his spy agents, that David had entered into a city called Keilah. And so Saul determined to send his soldiers to that town to kill David, to assassinate him. But David also had some secret agents, and they found out that Saul was on his way down to Keilah. And so David decided to talk with God about the future. It's a very interesting story. The first question David asked God is this one. Will Saul complete his plan to come down to Keilah and attack us here. And God gave him the answer, because God knows the future, amen? God said, Saul will surely come down and attack you in Keilah. So David asked a second question of the Lord. When Saul attacks, will the people in Keilah fight on my side, or will they join Saul and turn me over to him. God who knows the future had the answer to that question as well. He said, they will not support you. They will turn you over to Saul. So what did David do after he found out what God foreknew about the future? Did David resign himself to dying in the town of Keilah? Not at all. David gathered his soldiers together and they left town quickly and hid in the mountains. And then Saul's secret agents heard about it. David was no longer in town. And so Saul canceled his campaign to go down and attack the town of Keilah. It's right there in the Bible. You can read about it. 1 Samuel chapter 23, verses 7 through 13. So God foreknows the free choices that we will make in the future. And he also knows the conditions under which we would make those free choices. God foreknew that as long as David stayed in the town of Keilah, Saul would continue on his mission to attack that town. God foreknew that if David stayed in town, 
the people of Keilah would not support him. They would turn him over to King Saul. Do you think God also foreknew what would happen if David left town? Yes. Of course. God foreknew that future also, that Saul would not come down and attack the city of Keilah. So maybe that story helps us a little bit as we begin today to wrestle with these difficult questions. Does God foreknow who will receive and refuse salvation? And if God foreknows the future, can he be free to influence that future? Is the future already settled because God foreknows it? And if God foreknows the future, can we be free to receive and refuse salvation? And finally, can we know what God foreknows about our free choices in regard to salvation. The central thesis of my sermon this morning is that in order to know what God foreknows about our free choices, we must make those free choices. By choosing, we come to know what God foreknew. Now, our choosing doesn't cause God to foreknow. Are you with me? Our choosing does not cause God to foreknow our choices because God foreknew our choices before we made them. But we come to foreknow. We come to know what God foreknew by making the choice. We cannot know what God foreknows about our choices unless we make the choices. Job chapter 34 and verse 4 points out that to choose is a kind of knowing. In biblical terminology, to choose is to know. Job chapter 34, verse 4, let us choose judgment. Let us know what is good. To choose is to know. The same idea is found in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 29. They hated knowledge because they did not choose to fear the Lord. In these texts, we have what we call Hebrew parallelism, where the first part of the text says the sec same thing as the second part of the text, even though different words are used. So to choose is a kind of knowing. Let us choose judgment. Let us know what is good. They hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. In order to know what God foreknows about our free choices, we must make our free choices. We must make a choice. Based on this thesis, I'm impressed by the Spirit of God to preach to three groups of people in church today about three choices relevant to receiving or refusing salvation. So please pay attention to which group you are in. Some of us may fit into more than one group. Group number one, there are some here today who will choose between faith and unbelief. Group number two, there are some here today who will choose between hate and love. Group number three, there are some here today who will choose between hope and hopelessness. Now you say, preacher, suppose I choose not to choose. <laughs> well, my message today to you is that the one thing you can't choose today is not to choose. When we think we are not choosing, we are choosing. We are still making a choice. We are not free to choose not to be free. We are free to make choices. And so, whichever group you find yourself in today, you will choose today between faith and unbelief, between love and hate, and between hope and hopelessness. You remember the story of Joshua as recorded in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. What did he say to the children of Israel? Choose you this day 
whom you will serve. That text is in the imperative mood. Choose you this day. It's a statement of command. We could paraphrase it and say, you will choose this day who you will serve. Joshua is gathering the people to enter the promised land. They're going to face hard times and challenges and war and difficulties along their way. And he's saying to them, we're not leaving to enter the promised land until you make a choice. You need to make a choice. And I want you to make a choice today. Are you on the Lord's side or are you not on the Lord's side? Choose you this day whom you will serve. Like Joshua, I am here today to try to influence your choices. But whether or not you listen to me, you will still choose. So I hope you will listen carefully and choose wisely. Now, therefore, as I address each of these three groups here today, I'll be dealing with the issue of foreknowledge and freedom in relationship to salvation and the question of how do we know what God foreknows about our free choices. So, group number one, God foreknows that today you will choose between faith and unbelief. Where's group number one? Well, you're all mixed together. <laughs> group number one, you will choose today between faith and unbelief. Does God really know what we will choose with regard to faith and unbelief? Let's go back to our scripture reading in Romans chapter 11. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. The Holy Scriptures makes it quite clear that God foreknows his people. He foresees his people. But who are these people whom God foreknows? They are the people who exercise faith. You notice that in chapter 11 and verse 20. Well, because of unbelief, some were broken off and cast away. But you stand by faith. God's people stand by faith. And it is these people who choose faith, of which God speaks in verse 2 of Romans chapter 11, when it says, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. And this choice of faith is truly a free choice. You can see that if you read verse 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on those who fell away from faith, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off and cast away. So faith is a choice that we make. We choose to stand by faith, and we choose whether or not we will continue to stand in faith. So God really does foreknow those who will make a choice between faith and unbelief, and God does not cast away his people whom he foreknew. But if God foreknows our faith, before we choose to exercise faith, are we really free to make the choice? Well, there are a number of reasons why I think we can be confident that we can still be free even though God foreknows our choices. Number one, it's not our choice that causes God to foreknow because God foreknows what we're going to choose before we choose it. Number two, God is the one who facilitates our freedom to choose between faith and unbelief. And if God is backing up our freedom, who can be against us? Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 is a very familiar text that I'm sure you know already. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The ability to choose between faith and unbelief 
is given to us through God's Word. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, God gives to everyone the measure of faith. Do you believe the Word of God? God gives to each of us the measure of faith. So we're all free to choose between faith and unbelief because God Himself, in His omnipotent power, is actively involved in facilitating our freedom to choose between faith and unbelief. We are free because God has freely decided that He's going to facilitate our freedom. He's going to create in us the freedom to choose. He's going to protect our freedom and ensure that we are free. And when we choose faith, we can continue in the faith because God has promised to sustain our faith. Isn't that good news? Yes. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. He facilitates our faith so that we have the freedom to choose it. And then he finishes our faith. He sustains our faith. He gives us the ability to endure in the faith. And he rewards our faith with an act of justification. Isn't that good news? We are justified by faith. He looks at us just as if we had never sinned. He completely pardons us because we have chosen to receive his righteousness by faith. So even though God foreknows our free choices, our choices still are really free. They are not determined and controlled by his foreknowledge, because God himself facilitates our freedom and sustains our freedom and responds to our freedom when we choose between faith and unbelief. But that now brings us to the final question. How can we know, those of you in group one, those of you who will choose today between faith and unbelief, how can you know what God already foreknows about your choice between faith and unbelief. In order to know what God foreknows, we have to make a choice. We don't need to wait around for special evidence that God accepts our choice of faith. We can take God's word for it, amen? You can't find better evidence than that for what the facts of the matter are. Take God's word for it. When the angel Gabriel came to Zechariah and told him that he would have a son, Zechariah wanted more evidence than what the angel had said. And do you remember what the angel said to Zechariah? Zechariah says, how can this be? Give me some evidence. The angel said, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of the Lord. Is that not enough evidence for you? <laughs> God said it. I believe it. That settles it. But Zechariah was stubborn. He continued to ask for more evidence. And so Gabriel said, all right, you want evidence. Here's your evidence. Until the child is born, you will be dumb. So let us not be reluctant to take God at his word. Amen? He says that he has given us the measure of faith. And he facilitates our faith through the preaching of his word. And he knows what our decisions will be, but our decisions are still free. But we cannot know what he foreknows until we make the choice ourselves. So you will choose today between faith and unbelief. And I plead with you to choose faith. Group number two. God foreknows that today you will choose between love and hate. Does God really foreknow our choices between love and hate? The Bible makes that quite clear. Again, here in Paul's letter to the Romans. Just turn back one page to Romans chapter 8, and let's look together at verse 28 and 29. Does God foreknow our choices between love and hate? And hate. And are we free in our choices between love and hate? Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. And we know that all things, how many things? All things work together for what? 
for good to those who love God. That's a wonderful promise, isn't it? All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And then verse 29 informs us that those who love God are those whom he foreknew. Do you see it? God foreknows not only those who will choose faith, but God foreknows those who will put their faith to action in works of love. God foreknows our choices between love and hate. And love really is a free choice. If love was not a free choice, it would not really be love. It would be rape. But God facilitates our free choice to choose between love and hate. If God knows that we will choose to love him, are we really free to respond to him in love? Of course. As with our faith, so with our love. God has committed himself to facilitate our freedom to choose between love and hate. 1 John chapter 4 in verse 19 says, We love him because he first loved us. God facilitates our love by initiating his own love toward us. We all know John chapter 3 and verse 16, don't we? Let's repeat it together. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. God loves the whole world, but the whole world does not love God. Did you get that? God loves the whole world, but the whole world does not love God. And that's the proof right there that we are free to choose between love and hate. God's love facilitates our freedom to love him in return. We love him because he first loved us, but he loved the whole world. And not everybody responds to God's love with love because we are free. Now the same thing applies to our love for each other. We have to make a free choice to love. And God facilitates not only our love for God, but God facilitates our love for each other when he shows us his love. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20. If you say that you love God and yet you hate your brother, what does that mean? You're a liar. You're not telling the truth. We are free to choose to love God, but we are also free to choose whether or not we're going to love our neighbors. God not only facilitates our free choices between love and hate, but God sustains our free choice when we choose to love him. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17 says, Christ dwells in your heart so that you may be rooted and grounded in love. Isn't that good news? God does not only ask us to make a choice of love, but when we make that choice, he backs it up. He dwells in our hearts so that we might be rooted and grounded in love. And he responds to our love with the miracle of transformation called sanctification. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. The Lord make you to increase and abound in love so that he might establish your hearts blameless in holiness. That word holiness is just another word for sanctification. In the Greek language in which the New Testament is written, it's the word hagiasmos, which can be translated holiness or sanctification. So as we make the free choice of love, God sustains our choice of love, and he sanctifies those who are in love with God. I'm so happy to be here with you, part of your fellowship this morning. As I look down into the congregation, I can see that some of you have already made the choice, most of you, all that I can notice. You've already made the choice between love and hate. I can see the love of Jesus beaming forth from your faces. It's just wonderful to be in your presence. 
But just in case there's someone here who hasn't made the choice, how can we know what God foreknows about our free choices between love and hate? We must make the choice. We must choose love. And when we choose love, we choose to know what God foreknows about our love relationship with Him. The wife said, I do not only want to get rid of Him, I want to get even with Him. Before I divorce Him, I want to hurt Him as much as He has hurt me. The consular said, Go home and act as if you really loved your husband. Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for all his good traits. Go out of your way to be kind and considerate and generous as possible. Spare no efforts to please him, to enjoy him. Make him believe that you love him. And after you have convinced him of your undying love, and that you cannot live without him, then drop the bum. Tell him that you're going to get a divorce. That will really hurt him, won't it? The wife said, beautiful, beautiful plan. Won't he ever be surprised? And she went out of the consul's office, and she applied his advice with enthusiasm, acting as if for two months she showed love and kindness, listening and giving, reinforcing and sharing. And a long time passed, so the consular called her up and said, are you ready now to go through with the divorce? The wife said, divorce? Never. No divorce. I discovered that I really do love him. Her actions had changed her feelings. Motion resulted in emotion. And so she fell in love with her husband all over again. That's a good story, isn't it? Who am I preaching to this morning? Am I just preaching to the women or also to the men? Husbands, love your wives, just like Christ loved the church. It's a choice that we make, isn't it? A choice to love God and a choice to love our family and our fellow men. And the really hard choice to love your enemies. But we are free to make this choice. God foreknows that we are free to make the choice. And in some mysterious omniscient power within his divinity, he even foreknows which choice we're going to make. But we're still free. And we must make the choice. And when we make the choice, we come to know what God foreknows about our free choices. So you will choose today, if you haven't done so already, you will choose today not only between faith and unbelief, but between love and hate. I plead with you, choose love. Group number three, we're almost done. There are just three groups, right? Group number three, God foreknows that today you will choose between hope and hopelessness. Does God really foreknow our hope? Well, since God foreknows our faith and our love, then He surely also foreknows our hope. Because faith, love, and hope go together. You remember what Paul says? And now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. If God knows the greatest of these, our choice between love and hate, then he also knows our choices between hope and hopelessness. Romans chapter 5, verses 1, 2, and 5 says, Being justified by faith, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God, because the love of God is poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And I really like Galatians chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. This text also links together these three, faith, hope, and love. Faith works by love. 
Galatians chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. We wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, which works by love. I paraphrase the text a little bit for you there, but you read it. It says that. We wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, which works by love. Isn't that good? And God foreknows our faith, and he foreknows our love, and he also foreknows our hope. God facilitates our hope. That's why we are free to choose between hope and hopelessness. I love what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 15 and verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you up with all joy in believing. Isn't it wonderful to think of God as the God of hope? He's the God who is the source of our hope. Because he is the God of hope, he can facilitate our choice between hope and hopelessness. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy in believing so that you may abound in hope. The same Apostle Paul writes in another letter to the Colossians, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27, about how God will sustain our hope when we choose between hope and hopelessness. I love this text, Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Christ in you is the hope of glory. So we don't need to worry about whether our hope is weak or strong. Once we choose hope, Christ comes to dwell in our hearts as the hope of glory. And God will respond to our free choice of hope by giving us glorification. When we choose faith, we are justified. When we choose love, we are sanctified. And when we choose hope, we have an assurance of glorification when Jesus comes the second time. That's our blessed hope, isn't it? God glorifies those who hope in him. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So God foreknows our free choice between hope and hopelessness. God facilitates our freedom and sustains our freedom and responds to our free choice of hope by giving us the gift of glorification. But how can we know what God foreknows about our choices between hope and hopelessness? How do you know what God foreknows about your choice of hope? In order to know what he foreknows, you must choose. And today you will choose between hope and hopelessness. I ask you to choose hope. To choose hope is to know what God has foreknown about your reception of the hope of salvation. Someone says, if, if I've already exercised faith and I'm already in love with God, why do I need hope? We need hope along with faith and love because even faith and love do not earn our salvation. When you accept Jesus by faith, you haven't earned salvation. You've simply received the gift of justification. And even when your faith works in obedience to the law of God, you still have not earned your salvation. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But even keeping the commandments of God cannot earn our salvation. Therefore, in addition to faith and love, we need hope. Amen? Because the grace of God is the basis of our salvation. And even after 50 years of walking with Jesus, you still need grace if you have a hope of entering into God's eternal kingdom. Consider the testimony of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 15. Again, I'll paraphrase it for you to save time. Philippians 3, 4 through 15. Paul says, if anyone else thinks that he has something to trust in according to the flesh, I have more to trust in in terms of my own flesh than anyone else. 
I'm a Pharisee. I've kept the law from my youth up. Like the rich young ruler, he could have said, what lack I yet? But Paul didn't draw that conclusion. He says, what things were gained to me according to the flesh, I counted them as loss so that I might win Christ because this is my only hope of being resurrected from the dead. This is my only hope of glory. In myself, I am not yet perfect. That's the Apostle Paul, not yet perfect. And he was writing this just before his death. He was already arrested in the jail in Philippi. And he says, I don't count myself to be perfect, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth to those things that are ahead, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then I like how he ends this part of his letter. He says, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, have this attitude. I don't count myself to be perfect, but let us who are perfect have this attitude. There's a little paradox there, isn't it? I don't count myself to be perfect, but those who are perfect have this attitude. How do we solve that paradox? Here is the solution. In myself, I am not perfect, but in Christ, I am perfect. And I hope in Christ, Christ in me is the hope of glory. Yes, I have faith in Jesus, and he justified me. He pardoned me. He looks at me as if I had never sinned, but I still need hope. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Yes, I have chosen love, not hate. And through love, I keep the commandments of God. But I'm not yet perfect in myself. I'm only perfect in Christ. And my hope is in Christ. So even though we have faith and love, we still need hope. Because without Christ, we are hopeless. This is dramatized in the story of Abraham, recorded again in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. It says, Abraham, against hope, believed in hope. In other words, in a hopeless situation, Abraham chose to exercise hope. What was hopeless about Abraham's situation? The text tells us he considered not the fact that his body was dead since he was 100 years old. Now we have to learn to read the scriptures, right? When it says his body was dead, it doesn't mean that Abraham had already died. It's a figure of speech for the fact that Abraham was so old that he couldn't have children anymore. He had become impotent, to put it bluntly. He considered not the fact that his body was dead, that his situation was hopeless with regard to fathering a son. But he hoped anyhow. He made a free choice to believe God's word and to exercise his hope. He considered not the fact that his body was dead or the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now, to be dead is to be truly hopeless. The dead man can't do anything to resurrect himself. A dead man is hopeless when it comes to accomplishing life. But Abraham, in a hopeless situation, chose to believe in hope. How hopeless was it? Genesis chapter 18, verse 12 says that when God sent the message that Sarah would have a child, Sarah laughed at the message. You can read it, Genesis 18, 12. Sarah laughed, saying, we are too old to have pleasure. Not only too old to have children, too old to have pleasure. We're in a hopeless situation. Nevertheless, when God said, I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to give you a son. God says, I'm going to do something. Abraham said to Sarah, let's do something. And the rest is history. They brought forth a child. His name is Isaac, the promised son, the seed of promise. We need hope because faith and love cannot earn us salvation this is so important, I want to say something else to drive home the point. Do you have a few more moments? 
Even before Adam fell into sin, he couldn't do anything to earn anything from God. How do I know? Because God created Adam out of dust. And before that, God created the dust out of nothing. So even before Adam fell into sin, what could Adam do to earn anything from God since God created him ultimately out of nothing? This means that Adam, even in his sinless state, was nothing apart from God. If you are nothing apart from God, how can you earn anything from God? Even Adam was hopeless apart from his creator. Who am I preaching to right now? There is someone here today who has never made a conscious decision to receive Christ as your personal savior. And you will choose today whether to receive him by faith or to continue in unbelief. I plead with you to choose faith. There is someone here today who has never made a conscious decision to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might and to love your neighbor, even your enemy, as yourself. That takes a free choice. You've never really made that conscious choice before. But today you'll make that choice. I plead with you, choose love. And there is someone here today who has never made a conscious decision to hope in God as an act of choice beyond faith and love, hope in God. Today you recognize that even as a Christian, in yourself you are still hopeless. Even as justified and sanctified, you're still hopeless apart from Christ. Today you recognize that your only hope is in the grace of God, even as a Christian. And you will choose today between hope and hopelessness. I plead with you, choose hope, hope in God. God foreknows that we are free to make these choices. God facilitates our freedom to make these choices. And when we make the choice, He is at work in us to sustain those choices and to reward us for those choices, though we cannot earn his salvation. God foreknows which choice you will make. Do you want to know what God foreknows about your choice? Make the choice. Make the choice today. If we make the choice, we know by choosing what God foreknows about our choice. Choose faith in God, amen? amen. Refuse unbelief. Choose love of God and love even of your enemies. Refuse hate. Choose hope in God. Refuse hopelessness. Did you make your choice? If so, I invite you to make that choice public by standing up as a testimony to your faith, your love, and your hope in God. As the songwriter says, stand up for Jesus. Stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads as we pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for who you are. God of all knowledge, you know the end from the beginning. You even know our words before we speak them. You know our choices before we make them. And yet, according to your word, we believe that we are free to choose. And today we choose faith. We choose love. We choose hope. And in so choosing, we come to know what you foreknew about us. We still don't understand how this works perfectly. But that's okay. We are creatures, and you are the creator. You are the God. When we get to heaven, we'll take a class in foreknowledge and freedom. But today we choose. We choose faith. We choose love. We choose hope. And we thank you for choosing us before we chose you. We thank you for loving us before we loved you. 
We thank you for having hope in us, even when we were hopeless. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, and for his sake, let the church say, Amen. 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 Let's remain standing for the closing hymn.